What is up, family and friends? Hey guys, TJ coming at you here. Welcome aboard. We are jumping into yet another family Bible study. And uh, so here we go. Um, this is First Peter that we've been in. And I'll be jumping directly into the text pretty quickly. But for you guys who are brand new, um, this of course is a Facebook Live, but this will also be on our YouTube channel. So some of you guys will probably be watching this on the time on YouTube, but that's the Faith, Hope, Love Initiative YouTube channel. Um, great place to go, especially the playlist section. Has a bunch of great ministries, a lot of encouraging tools, whether you're dealing with depression or angst or suicidal thoughts or addictions or you know uh, pornography or any of these type of many 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 things that attack and hold people at, at you know bondage there are some great great materials on there from like i said many different ministries that you can get in there and start putting the word of god in your ears and in your eyes and finding some encouragement and some courage um, sometimes when you are in dark places and you need that the spirit of god needs to be able to uh, rise up in you but a lot of times he uses things from the outside in to uh, do that and then he rises up from the inside out so again the faith hope love initiative youtube channel is a good place for you to go for those type of materials and feel free to of course reach out uh, to me as well and you can do that through our messaging or through our uh, email which is of course in the uh, description so without any further ado let's get right into first peter and um, I'm using, as usual, the, N the NASB 1995 version. We've gotten through um, or up to verse 4 in 1 Peter. So today we'll be getting into 5 and beyond, presumably. But I'm going to go back and start reading in verse 3 because it all kind of flows together. And if I jump right in at verse 5, uh, I think we're going to lose some continuity. So here we go. It says... Verse 3, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who according to his great mercy has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead, to obtain an inheritance which is imperishable and undefiled and will not ever fade away, reserved in heaven for you. Here's verse 5. This is where we're starting off tonight who are protected by the power of God through faith for a salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. So again, that is an inheritance that won't fade away, reserved in heaven for you, which means us. It's, this is Peter writing to the church, essentially, the greater church. Uh, for you, us, who are protected by the power of God through faith, for a salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. So, as we dive into this scripture, what, what stands out to me is the phraseology that we are to be protected by the power of God through faith. Now, what I've noticed about God's promises, and we've talked about this before on here, that one thing the Lord really just laid on my heart, pointed out to me, and I started seeing it everywhere I looked in scripture, is that his promises are conditional they're conditional they have a condition it's an if then scenario if you read through the old testament new testament he does not change when he makes a covenant with a with his with a people or a people group it's always like if you will obey me and you will listen to my commands and you will do these things so on then i will do these things for you and so often, I think, well, I know for myself personally, and I think probably a lot of us, often look past the condition, our part of it, and all we can see is God said that I'm going to be blessed, I'm going to be protected, he's going to take care of me. And so what that creates, when all you see is the promise, but you don't see the condition of the promise, is it can create a very flippant mindset that it's like, oh, you know, God's got my back, you know, God's going to take care of it. And we just go and live our lives, and that's how we walk into countless bad situations and what happens first and you maybe have experienced this you maybe know people who experience it then things go really bad and that's when people so often will look at god and go where were you 
I thought you were supposed to be taking care of me. It says right here in the word, you're my protector, you're my deliverer, you're my provider, you're my healer, you're these different things. Why am I not experiencing these things? It's because we have to look at the other side of it. And what is the other side of it? According to this verse, it says that we are protected by the power of God. That's true. Check that box. Through faith. That's our part. That's the required part that God, um, he can't do all that for us. Now, what he can do and what he does do is he facilitates the planting of the seed of faith. You know, Jesus told a parable where he said, that the kingdom of God is like a sower who goes out and sows seed. And some of the seed comes up, you know, well, some of the seed falls on hard ground. And that is to say, hard hearts. They hear the word of God, which is often through a preacher, through a teacher, through a minister of God, sometimes through reading the word of God. Uh, sometimes, you know, the Lord will impress something on your heart and you know it's from him. Either way it goes, it's the word, the living word, the Holy Spirit is facilitating a seed being planted in a person. And a hard heart says, yeah, I hear that, but I'm not going to do that. That's not for me. And they walk away. And that's not going to produce the things that we want to see in our life, the protection, the power of God working on our behalf in any area. It could be financially, it could be in our health, it could be in our relationships, it could be wherever the case may be. Okay. Uh, then it says some ground or some of the seed it falls on uh, soil that basically is very shallow. So what happens is it doesn't go real deep. So it pops up real quickly, but it doesn't put down very deep roots. And so the sun scorches it. And the sun can represent all kinds of things in life that basically, even though we receive the word with gladness, we hear the word and, you know, when we were the people in church going, amen, you know, that's right. Preach it, preach it, you know, and all these things. And we are actually genuinely excited about what was said. And we're going out and we're going to run out there and do something with it. But you are not very maybe uh, mature or maybe we just simply don't know how to hold on to the word yet. In You know, in spite of adversity in our life, which is very often what the sun represents is adversity that hits our life. That's contrary to what we just heard preached. OK. And anyway, it scorches it. That's done. That seed is cyanora. It's not going to produce the things God wanted to produce. Now, he's he's sowing the seed because he wants to produce a good harvest in our lives, um, not just for our sake, but for the glory of his kingdom, for other people's sake as well. And so that seed doesn't do well. Well, then there's also the other seed. He said it does, you know, get in the ground, germinate, starts coming up. But the thorns and thickets and things of life choke it out. And that's he talks about, Jesus points out, those are things like worrying. You know, it's very acceptable in society to worry. It's very normal to worry. And some people look at you like you're crazy if you say, well, I'm not going to worry. Well, then you're not responsible. You don't care. You don't these things. Um, but that's not what Jesus said. Jesus very specifically tells us over and over, don't worry. Now, in our human capacity, you know, and I know, there's no way in the world we're going to not worry within our human capacity because we're concerned with how things are going to turn out and so on and so forth. Now, from a logical standpoint, try to list, get a piece of, piece of paper and a, and a pen sometime and start with number one and start listing the things that worrying, just the act of worrying itself has ever helped you with, ever done good, ever any problem it's ever solved, ever. And you won't get past number one. Worrying never helps you at all. We just succumb to it. And it's not a sin to have the emotions of worry. You can have something come on you as like, you need to worry about this or be concerned about that. That's not a sin by any stretch of the imagination to experience an emotion coming your way. Jesus showed that in the Garden of Gethsemane when he was dealing with a whole lot. You know, he's sweating blood. He's dealing with so many emotions attacking him and, you know, his own wills attacking him and so on. Nothing wrong with that. If it comes to your doorstep, your mind, my mind, um, the feelings come upon us, you know, physical uh, responses. You could be sweating and still be like, I refuse to worry. You could be, you know, shaking in your boots and go, I'm not going to fear. Those are physiological things. Those are mental. Those are emotional things. But we have something bigger than that in us. And that's the Holy Spirit. And we can get, get a revelation from him that goes like this. I'm going to take care of that. God's going to take care of that. That situation is going to be taken care of. And because it is, I don't care that my teeth are chattering, you know, with the 
physical physiological um reaction of fear i don't care that my my you know my hair standing on end or something i don't care that i have all these things trying to pressure me about maybe your family situations your financial situations or whatever you can still with the help of god you can stand up in the midst of that and say i don't care i refuse to care i refuse to worry now does that mean you're you know you're just irresponsible you don't do um, what the lord gives you to do no it just simply means you refuse according to the word of god to succumb and uh, let your mind just run ragged about be ran ragged about certain things and again i'm we're all work in progress and things like that but here's a maybe a candid question for you uh, do you want to live your life in worry is that what you want is that your will i desire to live in worry if it's not your will to do to live in worry then it would be my suggestion you know really based on what jesus specifically told us he didn't suggest don't worry he told us not to um to start to stand up against that and it, one way to do that is with your words when you feel that fears and cares of life coming on you instead of as this parable talks about with jesus being choked out by the worries the cares the concerns uh the things of life then you stand up and start saying hey I'm not going to worry about that. I'm not going to concern myself with that. And your mind may be getting bombarded left and right. How are you going to get the, you know, this figured out? How are you going to get this taken care of? And how are you going to make this happen? And how's the money going to come in for this? And what are you going to do with your health here? And the doctor said this. And the, you know, professionals in this area said this. And your lawyer said this. And all these different things. You can stand up in the middle of that junk and say, I don't care what they said. This is what Jesus said. Do not worry and you put those words in front of you over and over and, I, and that's in like matthew 6 but there's other places in the bible that you know say that one of the most repeated phrases in the bible is do not fear fear not which is fear worry is just a lower degree of fear you know it's just, so anyway the point is jesus talks about that and if we succumb now why am i going on and on about this because we want the protection of god we want the good things of god to be manifest in our life I do, and I would imagine you do too. But if the, the seed of God, the word plant in our heart, gets choked out by worry, and then what happens is we start to act and react and take actions based on worry, we will not experience the goodness of God he desired for the situation. And so it makes it null and void. It's just like the seed of God was never planted in your heart. You went to church, you heard a great sermon, you read your Bible halfway through the day and all the way through the night, you got a ton of word in you, and it didn't produce anything. So now we've covered three grounds, right? So far, the type of seed was sold, it sold into three different grounds so far. The first was the hard ground. Second was the shallow ground. The third was the weedy ground uh, where the fears and cares and deceits of riches, you know, start chasing money. We start chasing things. We start chasing status. These type of things these three grounds have produced nothing thus far then there's the fourth ground and that's the good fertile ground a heart that receives the word and in spite of adversity it holds on to what the lord said now how do you do that reinforcing it you you if there's a verse that stands out to you like i know I went through some extremely challenging times in my life with money and just job situations and business situations and all kind of things. And I would just keep my Bible open to Matthew 6 that talks about do not worry. And I would just come in and I would read that over and over. And I said, you said it right here. This is true. This is true. And I go back out and face the challenges and I come back in. I'd read Matthew 6 and I go back. Not all Matthew 6, but there's some certain sections that talks about do not worry. Um, kind of the middle, the end of it. And so you, reinforcing that is uh, was huge for me. And I still do that to this day. When I'm dealing with challenges and things like that, I always go back, what did God tell me? What did God tell me? Now, I'm not the standard. I'm not trying to pretend to be. I've been fallible and failed in lots of situations like I'm sure you have too. Jesus is the standard. But I'm saying these are some, some best practices that will help you in those particular situations to overcome. So you can be good ground. You hear the word of God. You receive it with joy. I believe that. That's true. Even right now, you know, as I'm speaking to you, we're talking about the word of God. And you can believe these things or you can reject these things or you can hear them for a little bit and then forget them or whatever the case may be. Like always, uh, we have those options. Or you can hold on to the word that you get 
and you can allow it to get deep in your soul and you can reinforce and you can go through the scriptures yourself and talk to God about it and reinforce it. And, and what will happen is if seed goes into good soil, soil, it always comes up and will produce whatever it's supposed to produce. You know what I mean? In natural world, if there's good rain and blah, blah, blah. But you know what I mean? It, that's what the seed does. That's the only thing it's there to do. It doesn't do anything else. It brings up what's inside of it. The DNA of that seed brings up a harvest. And so if you will hold on to the word of God, and if I hold on to the words that God has given me, it will eventually produce. And that's why Satan is so against the uh, word of God getting in us. Because once it's planted, in essence, as long as we hold on to it, he's already lost. We have to give it up or else we will get the reward of it. Okay. And so if we want to see the protection and all these different things that God has promised us, the provision of God, the help and so on in our own lives. Now, we can't do this for everyone else's lives, you know, necessarily all the time. And we can affect people's lives through prayer and intercession and things like that. But when God gives us a promise, it's up to us to keep that promise. I can't keep it, you know, safe, so to speak, and make sure it produces for your life. And you can't do that for my life. If you want your health to improve, I would recommend getting in the word of God about health and healing until there is a scripture that just jumps out and grabs you from the inside out. And you're like, that's my scripture. I believe that. Not just intellectually, but there's just something about it. There's a quality about it. That's the empowerment of the Holy Spirit. That's what it is. It's hard to try to explain it physically, but the Spirit of God will illuminate. It's, there's no other reason that this scripture should stand out more than any other scriptures, but it does. Um, I told you guys when I had COVID, it was, but the Lord, I, I knew lots of scriptures about healing. I was reading through lots of scriptures on healing, um, heard them from all, you know, all throughout my life. But there was one in the Bible, which was found in Malachi 4.2. And uh, it talked about the sun of righteousness rising with healing in its wings. And that one illuminated. And that was the one I held on to as I was going through that. Well, again, why that one? Why not other ones? That one was the, word, the one that the Holy Spirit illuminated for me. And I held on to it. Now, it may not be for you. If you're dealing with some kind of physical symptoms or whatever the case may be, I'm not saying you need to go and grab that scripture and make that your scripture. It won't work because it's not from God. It's just from me. You know, but if he's giving you one and it could be that same one, then you want to hold on to it. Okay. And what you will see is that that is what faith is. Faith is becoming fully persuaded is one way the Bible defines faith. It talks about Abraham being fully persuaded that God would do what he said he would do. And in this case, he had told Abraham, I'm going to give you a son, even though Abraham was like at the time 99 years old. And didn't actually have the child till 100 years old. Um, but he was fully persuaded. He said, hey, God said it. Doesn't make any sense naturally. But hey, it's God. So he's going to do it. And since he was fully persuaded and he held on to the word of God, he got what he would believe. And that's true for Abraham, you know, those thousands of years ago. But it's also true for you and me today. And so we can do the exact same thing through faith. That is the transaction, the legal transaction that allows God to do what he wants to do on the earth. So, again, people say, and again, I made a post about this on Facebook. You know, people say God is in control, period. Well, according to God, your faith gives him the right to either do things for you or not do things for you. He's not in control of that per se. Now, do all things work together for the good of those who loved him? Are all things going to eventually work out the way he's, you know, angled them to work out, etc.? Uh, yeah, that's going to happen. You can read the book of Revelation, and it will make that very clear to you. But that doesn't mean everything's going to work out in my life. It doesn't mean everything's going to work out in your life the way it should, according to his plan. We have to be involved with that, okay? So let's move on from there. But that's verse uh, five that says that, that we are protected by the power of God through faith. And it says for salvation, ready to be revealed in the last time. And I just talked about Revelation and you can read through that and it gives some idea, an inkling of an idea of what's to come. But it's less than, you know, we watch movie trailers again, not try to get an idea of what's going to be in the movie. Revelation is like so compact and small compared to the glory that God has planned for those of us who uh, maintain or sustain or remain with him to the very end. We don't decide to go and, you know, 
break up our relationship with God and say, forget you. I'm going to go and chase the world. I don't want you anymore. You know, just like a divorce, you know, in a marriage situation, we're in a covenant with God, just like a marriage is supposed to be a covenant, but a person can go, you know what, I'm out. And they can leave that relationship and go and chase, you know, whoever they want to go chase. And they have the freedom to do that. Just like when people get, you know, cast away the God and walk away from God, they have a lot of quote unquote freedom to go and chase the world, which is really just slavery, just so you know, but they're free. They're free to go. But what you're going to find is they're not free to stop. They're free to go, but they can't get rid of these habits and these things that catch them up. So what they really do is they run into slavery to other things. But when they leave the relationship with God, they're leaving behind the benefits of that relationship. Just like, a, again, like a marriage, whatever there was, the benefits that were in that relationship and that covenant and whatever, whatever benefits there were, could be physical, financial, emotionally, spiritual, whatever. They're leaving those behind. And that's what people do when they leave God. And so for those of us who endure, we are going to inherit heaven. And you got to remember, in our existence, living on this planet is the shortest thing we'll ever do. I mean, if you live 100 years old, what is that compared? Compa what's 100 compared to a billion? $100 compared to a billion dollars? It's nothing. What's 100 years compared to a billion years? Nothing. I mean, it's absolutely nothing. And we're not going into a billion years after this life. We're going into eternity you know it never is going to stop so what we do right now on this earth is extremely important because it's preparing us and um, it's situating us for what's to come and that's the salvation god's already planned it out he's not planning it out it's already planned out you know kind of like my uh, one of my uncles had a surprise birthday party this last weekend he turned 80 and uh, they they got him he walked in and um, i wasn't there i got to see pictures later but uh, you can see he was just like shocked. He had no idea what was uh, going on or what was prepared for him. And he thoroughly enjoyed it, you know, from all, um, all reports and things like that, um, being celebrated and the people that were there and, you know, family members that were there. And that's kind of like a little microcosm or a little example of how it is for us. God's prepared for us more than we're expecting. And we walk in those into that reality, so to speak, as we walk into that, uh, into heaven's gates, if you want to put it that way, or in, into those times, we are going to be awestruck. Uh, you know, we're going to be speechless in so many ways, I'd imagine. And um, and so the best for us is yet to come. Okay, so let's move forward to, to verse six. It says, speaking of our inheritance being revealed in the last time, it says, "In this you greatly rejoice." Even though now for a little while, if necessary, you have been distressed by various trials. Now that's a very kind way of Peter putting that. Because in his day and age, now you have to remember, this is the Apostle Peter from the time that, you know, the church in, was originally started after Jesus left. It wasn't very much time before he was being persecuted along with the other disciples by King Herod. He's being thrown into the jail for nothing, for no reason, you know, other than just talking about Jesus. He's getting beat and they're rejoicing that they were beat for Jesus. Like, this is amazing, you know. Jesus specifically told them when that happens, rejoice, be glad, you know, because you are going to, uh, first of all, you're in good company. That's what they did to the prophets. But there's reward. God is a rewarder. That James, we just went through the James Bible study. Um, no, I take that back. Hebrews. Hebrews 11, 6, I believe, says that, right? That um, God is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. Okay? He's a rewarder. So whatever we have to put up with on this planet, you know, um, for our faith, not for our mistakes, not for stupidity, not for bad decisions on our part. Now we have to, you know, deal with the consequences of those bad decisions. But what we do for him and we re and we have persecution for uh, those things we will be rewarded for. And you, if you know, if you know God at all, he's not going to be like just turning blind eye and go, OK, well, you know, you should have done that. You know, that's the least you could do for me. You know, Jesus died for you. So you can it's the least you could do is, you know, take some flack at your job or take some hate from some people over here or get beat or whatever. It's not how he operates at all. He's like, I'm going to remember this. And I'm going to reward you for what you what you're putting up with. And so we have to be willing. We don't have to be, but it's um, it is the the example Jesus set, and the church is supposed to follow. That we are to be willing to put up with a lot, you know, from each other, 
from fellow believers, from the world, for persecution, from whatever, for the sake of Christ. You know, that's what you did, Jesus. That's what I'm going to do, too, just the same. And so when Peter's talking, Peter's talking to a church body that I believe at this time, historically speaking, and again, I've put the uh, a link for um, the Bible Project, their rendition of First Peter, kind of their breakdown analysis of First Peter, and there's the what they would call the historicity or whatever, but the history of what was going on in the church at that particular time. And Peter uh, was under the emperor Nero, and Nero was super evil. This man was literally putting Christians, again, he says, if for a time, in this verse here, he says, if for a time you, um, you know, you have been distressed by various trials. Their trials were like getting thrown into the Colosseum, the arena, the gladiator arena, with wild animals who are ripping them apart and their family members are being ripped apart why because they are christians you know um they're believers their trials are like nero would cover them in oil and things and literally light them on fire their, their trials were i think it was the emperor nero that eventually uh crucified peter and according to church tradition he was crucified upside down various trials and so he's saying in this, Peter's saying, in this greatly rejoice that you have an inheritance because once they kill your body, what else can they do to you? It's essentially what Peter's saying. Even, you know, even if they don't kill your body, they just persecute you. You think about what you're going to get on the other side of that. And when your mindset is set on this planet, what's happening to you or me now, and it's easy to get in that mindset. The whole world pressures us to look at the here and now, as we said last week. Um, it's very easy to get discouraged, get down. And the reason is, you're most often in many in many many cases we're thinking about ourselves how is this affecting me how, i'm not getting what i want i want these things to move faster i want to have more of something i want more whatever the opportunity may be that you want more of i want more money i want a, a significant other i want children i want a better job i want a car i want blah 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 me 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 and when you are focused on, as we've all known from experience, focused on you, it's easy to get down. But when you're thinking about Jesus, when you're thinking about what he's done and that he's seen what you're doing and that he's pleased and you think about our Heavenly Father being pleased with what we're doing, those, those things that come your way, yes, it's still not fun, but that's where the joy comes in um, because it's not normal that we would deal with persecution and issues and still rejoice. How do you do that? You don't do it from a natural standpoint. But I'll tell you, the more time you're spending with the Lord and just soaking in his presence and his and time with him, the more he can strengthen you from the inside out. The answer, as always, is to get closer to the Lord, get nearer to him. However you do that, could be through praise and worship, could be through reading the word of God, could be through fellowshipping with the believers, um, usually a combination of all of the above. But different days require different things. But, but as farther we get away from, you know, the fire, so to speak, the colder we tend to get using a, you know, simple analogy. And so the closer we get to the fire, like God said, he said, draw near to me and I'll draw near to you. And that's a promise for all of us. Once again, if it's a promise, there's a condition. Where's the condition? Oh, I have to draw near to him and then he'll draw near to me. And when he draws near to you, then you have a strength, you know. Just like um, getting into a, a big hug from your father, right? If you want the warmth and all that th that goes along with a big bear hug from a father figure, let's just say, and I realize some, not everyone had that in their life and whatnot, but I'm just saying, if you want that, you have to draw near and then you get those benefits, right? And we can draw near to our Heavenly Father and get the benefits of His love, okay? And so um, I want to make this last comment on verse 6, and that's going to be it for tonight. It says, in this you, you greatly rejoice in our inheritance, even though now for a little while, if necessary, you have been distressed by various trials. I want to point out the word little while, because these things that we're going through, as the Apostle Paul said elsewhere, these are temporary things. And if we look at our challenges today and go, you know what, you're temporary. I've been through challenges before. Those were temporary. Even if temporary means it's persisted for years you're still temporary and in the end i'm going to win over you when you have that attitude that you're going to win in the end it will help bolster that faith that revelation that you have from god because again we're always thinking that we should always be considering how do i strengthen the faith how do i strengthen what the lord's already told me and as we strengthen that 
we will um, we will overcome will overcome and we will see the goodness of God in the various areas in our life that we need to see for a breakthrough and again it's not about us it's not about our lives just us having a breakthrough what the Lord is wanting to do is it for us but also through us to other people and so we make ourselves a vessel of good everywhere we go as we submit to him and we learn to overcome the challenges that we're dealing with not sometime in the future but the ones we have to deal with today so hopefully that encourages you i'm encouraged so i'm glad i tuned in but we will see you guys next time and remember as i always like to remind you god does not owe you anything but he loves you and he has already done more for you than anyone else ever will all right guys love you next time if you have found this teaching helpful consider subscribing to the channel and click the notification bell that way you'll be alerted whenever new content is released from the Faith, Hope, Love Initiative channel.